Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 40K Fireside Podcast. I'm David Gaylor, and I'm joined by my good friend, Vic Vijay. Together, we discuss 40K in the meta from our perspective, along with events we've recently been to and those that have got coming up. So come on down to the fireside and listen. All right, everyone. It's a, uh, it's, uh, it's still sunny outside. 6.30 a.m. here, getting up, doing back-to-back episodes. Uh, really excited for the WTC. This is episode 32. We're going to be chatting about the WTC singles. Well, we'll be chatting about a lot of topics, probably wherever we want to go. And I'm, uh, I'm actually really excited to have my guests here. Mr. Liam Hackett, the one and only, the force from Down Under, I think he's probably supposed to be called. Liam, you're not going to know that I'm going to do this, but um, your name, uh, you know, when you uh, go and play tournaments with your teammates and what like that, or you're going to meet up with other top players uh, at the tournament scene, Liam's name does come up every once in a while when the uh, mention of who do you think X player rates or however X player is good. And Liam's name is always up there, I will tell you, as uh, everyone thinks Liam is extremely good. So <laughs> uh, I have no doubt he's an absolute machine. Uh, champions of the WTC last year, uh, champion, champion of the singles event last year, top sportsmanship as well. What else do you want in a 40K player? He's also a doctor to my best knowledge. So seems like an all around good bloke. And I've been chatting to him a little bit before the show. So he seems like a really nice guy. Liam, welcome to the show. It's uh, it's really- Thanks very much. Great. I've managed to get you fooled already. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I that's how I get, that's how I do my guests. I pamper them up and then I bring them back down uh, later in the episode. But, butter them up before you get started. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So today we're going to be chatting about the WTC singles event. Now, this is a seven round, no, I believe it might be an eight round event that happens a couple of days before the WTC. It's an open, it's an open event. And I think to date, it's got about 297 players involved in it. So um, a few more players than the team event. But I think a lot of people from the team event don't play the w, the singles event for a couple of reasons, right? They don't want to play it because... It's a bit of a marathon effort to play the singles into the teams. Uh, and then if you're playing the team event, you don't want to get uh, scouted. You don't want your list doesn't want to get seen. But the advantage is that it's really good practice, I think. You know, you get eight rounds on the terrain format in the building, um, playing maybe a list that's like adjacent to what you're playing. Or, you know, even if you're playing something totally different, I'm playing something totally different for singles than I am for the team event. But um, that's the format. Liam, how did you find it last year? Did you, you did the marathon effort last year as well. You did the singles into the teams. Was it, was it as bad as you, had, like, as it seems on paper playing, I don't know, 14 odd games or was it just exciting all the way through? Well, so when you say, was it as bad as it seems on paper, that the answer is profoundly worse, but also better. <laughs> so obviously playing 14 plus games of 40K in the span of about six days, uh, is the reason that in some of the photos after that event, I looked like a husk. I was, <laughs> I was extremely, I was also very drunk in most of those photos. But um, the the general point is that I think that it's it's a marathon effort, as you said, but it really depends what you're trying to get out of it. So for me, um, when I first went to the WTC, that was the longest and furthest that I, I'd ever traveled for a 40K event. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to make sure that, I wasn't hitting round one of singles with uh, round one of teams, sorry, with uh, those nerves, to be honest. I actually really like playing the Warmaster singles mm. uh, as a bit of an icebreaker, to yeah. be perfectly honest, because um, I, I find singles events generally relaxing mm-hmm. um, and sort of you, you don't have that added pressure. And so yeah. it meant that going into teams, I was already limbered up, ready, ready to mm. go yeah. uh, for the teams event. Um, and obviously, um, I, I think it suits me uh, as a player, but it's not for everyone, right? Mm. You know, for quite a lot of people, um, you need to conserve conserve that energy, have that sort of gamer's endurance to give the team's event your 110%. Mm-hmm. And you also rightfully said that um, uh, you don't want to play singles, presumably, uh, with the same list that you take to teams, especially if it's a unique take on a faction or a list mm-hmm. or has potential value uh, in pairings. And so... Yes. Um, Australia, just for anyone listening, ha- has a blanket rule that's been in place for a number of years and remains, I- I'm the captain of the Australian team this year and remains in place this year where uh, nobody is to play their team's list for singles mm-hmm. um, w- with some minor exceptions if you're playing like Imperial Knights, for example. You know, <laughs> the the battle cannon you put on your Crusader is not exactly going to be the unique take that wins the WTC. <laughs> but, it, but in general, um, 
most of the singles lists are not the team's army, and that's why my singles list is very bad. Yes, um, <laughs> sorry, not yes to your singles list is very really bad because I'm gonna I'm gonna go into that in a second. Um, but yes, I totally agree. I think there's there's a couple of different uh, types of players that would be that would gravitate towards that. But um, let me let me backtrack first. Um, you are also right in that obviously singles lists fundamentally. I guess one difference between us starkly probably is that um, I'm a sol I'm not a solo only singles player. I've been playing team events a little bit, but. I guess most of my time I've been playing singles and, you know, the, the playing into an open field where you should play against X, Y, Z is completely different to um, playing teams where you can go, I don't, I don't have to play against X, Y, Z, you know, play me against this, your, your list design and what you can bring in the availability of what is considered viable to win a big tournament with is completely different. So that's that, I guess that's the huge part about difference between singles and teams. But I think you touched on a good point, which is it's not for everyone, which I think it kind of just comes down to what type of player you are. I'm actually a lot like you when you mentioned that it's nice to get a few rounds in and just get the nerves off. You kind of go into the flow of things. I know I practice pretty much only on TTS, which means I, I don't believe Australia practice on TTS very much. You guys are more real life playing correct me if I'm wrong. D D David for the record I've stolen a computer from the Queensland <laughs> government for the purposes of recording this podcast I do I do everything on my phone uh, so the odds of me actually playing TTS are zero I love it it's so good um, <laughs> um, but if you're that's <laughs> great if you're like me then uh, you kind of will like rub off the get you know like get the uh, dust off a little bit you know get a few rounds in you it's kind of like you know rolling up the engine so to speak so I'm I'm a big fan of uh, I'm a big fan of playing the singles as well um so do we did you have a chance to go through the singles players list did you so i guess you know from last year i think i don't know how many people were in the tournament last year but i get the impression that it's quite a bit larger this year which is uh, great to see yeah a lot of people um, it. it's quite a bit larger um uh back to your earlier question if if i've had a look at the singles lists uh no mm -hmm. um i haven't looked at any of them um and the, the the main reason for that from from my perspective is that uh you know i'm very much a teams play like for 40k team events they're they're very sure. big in australia and there's quite a lot of teams events and for me that, that's my focus through and through mm -hmm. um the my attitude to war masters is that uh all of the time that i have available to me left i will do zero prep games Mm, yeah. uh, with, with my War Masters lists, um, the list that I have submitted, I have never played mm -hmm. um, and uh, will be using, hopefully, uh, assuming I don't play like you round one <laughs> at War Masters, I will be using those games as uh, sort of uh, the momentum building, fingers crossed, and um, also realizing that uh, the army does not function in any capacity. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, look, I, I haven't looked at the lists, um, but. Uh, I have obviously spent a prodigious amount of hours looking at the WTC teams lists mm -hmm. um, and some of the, the flow over into War Masters. Yeah, for sure. I'm just going to quickly cover your list that you are playing. The garbage list, as you would so to say. Uh, hey, they said it was garbage last year too, and it's <laughs> almost the same army. So, I will give you a caveat. Necrons is one of the armies that I've played the most of in 10th edition, actually. So when I saw your team's list as well, I had a lot of questions as well. And uh, I guess you could say you've probably seen our necron list and that's kind of reflection of where my head's at so i love i love wtc because you get to see it you know it's a battle of the ideas and it's a month a whole month has passed basically of el, el silencio silence to date so it's been so good to be like oh this player played this or something and actually because i played necron so much um liam one of your list was one of the first i looked at because you played necrons last year as well but let's go over the singles list because this one's quite, <laughs> quite good um you've got Triple Chronomancer, uh, you've got a Nightbringer, <laughs> you've got the uh, Transcendent Satan with the um, Four Up Feel No Pain. Some people are on this, some people don't like it. I've noticed that Poland doesn't play the Transcendent Satan, which is uh, really interesting. Uh, four, four units of 10 Necron Warriors, not even the, not even the 20s, but uh, that matches four Ghost Arcs. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> four now units with of Warriors, talking. four Ghost Arcs, Canoptic Reanimator, uh, a couple of Satan and uh, Catacomb Command Bunch, of course. And when I look at this list, I thought, Liam wants to practice the fundamentals of Necrons when he's playing the WTC, 
playing the singles event here because when I played Necrons, I actually found that there was an incredibly high skill cap uh, playing an army like this. I really love the minutia that you could optimize around saves, around maths, around reanimation positioning, uh, and everything like that. You know, the army doesn't have a lot of output, I would say, me personally, but um, I really enjoyed, and I thought the warrior aspect to the list was actually the most powerful list. So when I when I saw your, your WTC teams list, which is quite a bit different from this, but um, sort of thematically the similar you're one of the only people playing a warrior brick as well or two warrior bricks in this case um i thought we've sort of come to the same conclusion in that sense that i think that the warriors are the quickest way to hit the game so regardless of that are you going to be taking cleanse and teleport home every single game in the singles or not <laughs> well look the thing is is that david i, I i'm a sadist um i really like suffering and so mm -hmm. i think I think I'm going to, depending on who and what I'm playing against, I, I might kind of branch out and take like, I might actually do some behind enemy lines for a bit Oof. of a meme. Um, I'm, every now and then I might just go play tactical because I like CP and uh, failure is failure is fun. Um, look, it, it can probably do a bunch of different things. So you touched on an interesting point before that um, you, you looked at my list and your first thought was that... Um, Liam wants to to practice the fundamentals. Um, that's part of it, sure. Um, being fully honest, the other part of it is that um, there's two parts to this, uh, which you know so, so, sounds a bit bad. But the first part was because um, I, I won the Warmaster event last year with four ghost arcs filled with warriors. <laughs> I felt that if I even did mildly well again. Um, the internet would break, uh, and I thought that w I thought that would be very funny. Um, I also thought that uh, GW's stocks of ghost arcs would be dwindled uh, very very quickly, which I thought would just be a hilarious outcome overall. Um, the second thing is that um, the part of tenth edition th 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 there's a lot there's there's a long list here, which I, I don't want to deviate in too much. Um, but the part of tenth edition that I like the least is uh, that there's no longer a disembark from hull style mechanic yes uh, yeah. the skimmers of any description yep and so um i, I just he's, but I, I agree with most people's uh, assertion that that's a really ridiculous rule set and so i just kind of wanted to see if it could be done mm. i just kind of wanted to see if oh look i'm going to play an all skimmer army and i'm gonna i'm gonna see how this goes <laughs> Yeah, the, um, we can deviate on that too, because that's fine. Uh, I personally think this skimmer rule or no hull rule is the stupidest thing I've heard. And actually, if the hull rule was uh, in play, I would personally opt for playing a ghost arc myself. And that was one of the defining points why I didn't play a ghost arc was because of the uh, the skimmer base rule on WTC. Yeah. I felt that that was um, annoying. Like, I can really understand in your list. Um, by the way, guys, just to caveat, I'm trying not to talk about Liam's team list because Liam doesn't want to chat about his team list because he's a he's a he's a serious player. Unlike me, you know, we just see for go all day, baby. But um, which is uh, perfectly understandable. But yeah, my I kind of opted for the no um ghost stack only because the skimmer rule. Uh, if 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 the hull rule wasn't placed, I'd be all for it. So it's amazing how something like that can change things so much you know you're just talking about three extra inches of coherency so to speak or something like that but it's annoying because the ghost arc is obviously an enormous model with one tiny base in the middle so it's the most egregious example of that. yeah it is and it, it's kind of it's kind of why I'm, I'm doing it i mean it, it, it's a bit of a double-edged sword um with the way uh wtc terrain works with uh for those who haven't seen it all of the ruins have uh 12 inch by six inch bases Mm -hmm. um the measure everything to base rules uh, has some interesting applications when it comes to being in wholly within or partially within terrain yes um and so yeah the the ghost arcs are big small uh it's a bit of a weird bit of a weird they're, they're big small uh, yeah. i don't really know how else to word that uh it's yes. very weird it's a very yes. very weird dynamic Yes, my, uh, what Liam's alluding to here is that you can overhang half of your model onto the terrain whilst the skimmer base is not on the terrain, so it's not technically on the terrain, much like the Night Spinner uh, can also do, or, or the Waves, yeah. for example, as well. Uh, very, very bizarre, yeah. I've just looked, and I've just checked. Uh, it looks like the entire of Team Australia is playing the Warmasters Team Singles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, no, no, so... Um... 
we have some, uh, uh, everyone might have a ticket. Uh, it's kind of a, a general rule that we all kind of buy a ticket, but um, I encourage, we have five coaches this year, which is really, yes. really awesome to see. And all five of the coaches will be playing um, the War Master event. I encourage them wholeheartedly to do that. Sure. Uh, but some of the players uh, find they get a bit burnt out if they do both. So some of the players yeah. won't be. Yeah, I mean, maybe if you're, because, you know, obviously, you know, Team Australia is completely focused on the team's event as they should, remaining champions from last year. You know, maybe you come up to the War Masters, play a couple of rounds for one day, and then, you know, take the rest of the days off, right? Who cares, you know? You're there for the team event primarily as well, right? That's also exactly that. Uh, the team event is definitely the focus. Um, w one thing that uh, we, we've kind of noticed, I, I think, is a, a bit of a psychology difference. Um, in Australian events, it, it's considered um, quite rude to, to drop from an event. Mm -hmm. um, that, that it's, that's actually quite, quite frowned upon. And so mm -hmm. in general, this is probably the one exception um, to that rule where I would encourage players who want to conserve their energy to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of because in previous years, we've noticed uh, perhaps uh, cultural and community differences mean that it, it's less frowned upon, I think, is a fair statement. Yeah. Um, think whereas, for example, if you, if you did that at Uprising Adelaide, for example, in Australia, you'd, you'd be mocked. Yeah, I think that's a, and I've been mocked for dropping from a tournament, even over here actually as well. And I think it's sort of due to the tournament size, for, so to speak, isn't it really? You know, or, um, you know, if you have a, a special, well, coming from New Zealand as well, you know, smaller communities, you know, have a, has a larger impact if you drop, uh, particularly as well, sure. seen as a sign of weakness, so to speak. He's not, oh, you know, he dropped, he doesn't want to play, you know, or something like that. So it's a, I think that's all, all of that is a part of transitioning into a, a larger, more competitive, mature game. Hopefully, I think that will change in, in Warhammer. And look, sometimes it's good to drop because you've got family reasons or something like that on. Happened for me recently at a tournament. Um, and if you got, you know, at the end of the day, Warhammer is just a board game, isn't it? You know, you got <laughs> life's a bit more important than Warhammer. Or you could just be angry. Yeah. You know, like both of them are options. Like... <laughs> That's true. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, and of course, if you're traveling all the way from Australia or New Zealand, um, it's a great opportunity to maybe come early to Europe, maybe do a little bit of a holiday uh, and then maximize your time playing Warhammer uh, when you get there, right? Because you know, it's a big investment coming over from any, either of these countries. So you might as well get as much Warhammer as possible. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. We have four people from New Zealand playing the singles event. I encouraged, as a seed four team, uh, I encouraged everyone to go and play the singles event uh, out of my own sadism as well. But we're, I think we're also playing our... Um, I've just realized someone has listed Team New Zealand as their team, but they're actually not on our team. That's great. <laughs> uh, Jamie Beaton, you shouldn't be playing for Team New Zealand in the singles. Um, but I've encouraged them to use their team events because I think it would be a great opportunity, especially for players who don't have exposure or might be the first time at WTC to play their, the exact list they're playing on the terrain against European opponents who you know they might be playing against in the, few, uh, in, in the next coming days, just to fully adjust as much as possible. But um, I guess experts like Australia probably don't need to be using that time of uh, initiation period, so to speak, do you? Yeah, and, and, and you, you know, David, I mean, um, to, to, to be blunt as well, the, the, the fact that you, uh, you, you did want to ask questions about it, and uh, if he listens to this, the fact that uh, Alex Taus has been messaging me a number of questions asking specifically what that fucking flare in my list does uh, <laughs> means that there is a reason I shouldn't play my team's army in singles, right? Because... Um, <laughs> It, those those questions are, are you know there's no reason to give out free answers yeah exactly exactly and teams has a lot of uh, a lot of tech uh, in there as well so liam if you manage to break the internet and uh you know win, <laughs> win with i'm um, sorry i don't mean to laugh uh win with 40 warriors and four ghost arcs um you know what is i guess that is obviously success in one one sphere but what does success look like for the tournament in you otherwise? Is it just having a winning record with a list like this or is it just, you know, to learn more than anything, regardless of the record? Boy, um, what, what, what does success look like? Uh, that, that, that is a multi-layered question, David. Um, <laughs> I asked I mean, the good ones on here. Yeah, that's fair. Look, the, the, the reality is, is that um, last year uh, I, I was very fortunate um, and I, I did win the Warmaster singles and Australia won the team's event and I got the highest BP overall at the event and we won best sport. Um, and so 
from my perspective, it's kind of about par. We're kind of trying to do as good as um, previously because uh, unfortunately there's very limited room for improvement um, mm-hmm. in terms of like doing better in subsequent years. Yes. Um, success for me, I think, um, look, I think that as a person who's played exactly zero singles events in 10th edition, um, success for me would be um, winning against all bar a few key things. Mm-hmm. Um, but also one thing that was very um, valuable for me last year, to be honest, was I, I dropped everything that was Canop Tech from my team's army and took all the ghost arcs back then as well mm. um, for ghost arcs filled with warriors. You're seeing a theme here. And um, what playing that taught me was how good the Canatech stuff was. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it, it made me uh, like lust very powerfully for 27 Scarabs. Yeah. Um, and so when I started playing my team's list, it made me feel like unstoppable. Yes. And You're playing I, I think that there's just some kind of... Yeah, exactly. There's some kind of psychology element there for me sort of, um, you know, for example, I, I'm playing a Necron army for singles that has no crypto thralls in it, for mm-hmm. God's sake. So as soon as I start playing my teams list again, and I go, oh, that's right, crypto thralls are incredible. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that that psychologically for me would probably be the biggest success, me going into teams, knowing that uh, the list that I'm taking it, it is is what I know it to be. Mm, yeah, fantastic. Um, it's a really interesting uh, take on things. It's so it's so interesting to see how, just how focused, um, I guess, which is perhaps is a little bit of ignorance on my side or naivety. Um, you know, people are on the teams event as well. Because I think for me, I've been, you know, I, I guess you could say I'm in the complete opposite boat, right? I have mm. um, UK team over here. We have a singles team. Um, and then we have new team New Zealand, which is our first year coming to WTC for me. I'm just as excited to play the war masters singles as I am the deep. Um, and so I guess a lot of my focus has probably also been on focusing on the singles event uh, as well, or getting practice with my army. I'm playing Eldari. So trying to put my best foot forward to, uh, to win the event. Um, but yeah, what do you see as sort of, I guess, you know, apart from the obvious two, uh, GSC and Aldari. What do you see as the kind of main hitters um, on the WGC format for singles specifically? Well, I I mean, without being overly coy, it's kind of like a stat check win percentages in a (laughs) top-down approach, right? (laughs) um, You know, uh, I I think uh, GSC and Aldari are are the the clear winners there. I think Imperial Knights have remained they're kind of the kind of gatekeeper army that they've been for multiple editions where mm-hmm. um, Imperial Knights will always do very well. Uh, they probably get stopped before that kind of uh, final stage at an, at an event as large as mm-hmm. Warmaster, but they also prevent, um, because of their popularity, they, they prevent players who are not uh, aware enough of Knights or have taken something that can play against Knights mm-hmm. from getting to that next stage. Mm-hmm. Um, so I expect Knights to do... Uh, pretty well. Uh, I think against popular belief, I, I actually don't feel like um, I, I don't really feel like custodies are going to do mm. uh, particularly well at the Warmaster event. And I say that because uh, a combination of, I think, terrain factors, the size of the event, and the fact that the Warmaster event is a lot of people gearing for teams. Mm. Teams by design um builds extreme lists lists Mm. that are tech to do quite specific tasks and many of those lists seem to be to kill custody equivalent models be they (laughs) um deathwing terminators or custodies or Mm. blah 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 and i I think that um if you're running a gamut of a seven eight round event i think statistically uh you will encounter one of those armies Mm. um so my my money uh, you know as anyone who's a gambling man would be, would be on Eldari and GSC uh, being the premier. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, maybe a Necron dude with some ghost arcs. <laughs> I think it'd be hilarious. I, I, um, I actually, well, I, I quite like Necrons and uh, I've, I've painted my entire Necron army, but I wish I 
am waiting for Aldari and GSC to be pipped a little bit more. And then I think Necrons are definitely uh, definitely up there for sure. I think, you, yeah, you raise a really interesting point. And I quite enjoy Knights on the WTC board as well. I think mm. the, the teleporting mysterious Guardian Knight with Towering is, I think a lot of people look at that and think, oh, Knights are so easy to play against. But I think when you actually play in real life against Knights, it's very easy to forget something like that. It's very equals intuitively over the additions knights haven't had the ability to teleport and then towering is another layering rule on top of of on top of that which can allow you to get line of sight and angles that you previously wouldn't have so i think the teleporting um knight is actually uh really frustrating i know i've forgotten about it on on multiple games which has been uh just been quite annoying you do raise a good point which is that the war masters is quite unique in that a lot of people play their team list or come to a team's event and play team style list as well so it's not, I guess you could say, um, it's not an exact replica of, of a singles event, so to speak, because there is that mix of skew in there, which is uh, really interesting because it'll be interesting to see how the singles orientated only lists play against uh, teams list, for example, especially mm. because I guess the element of that is that so many people, the more the vast majority of people are traveling over into Belgium to play. So it's not, it's very unlikely that they'll be taking a singles orientated list along with you know the extra team models so to speak right so they will be sure, like yeah. teams orientated overall and and you know Dave on the topic of kind of lists in general I think that um you know uh, one thing you've articulated a couple of times while we've been talking is that um like you know you and I I suppose are, are focuses and, and perhaps that's due to availability of events or uh, you know like uh, personal goals etc but the you know my focus being quite firmly on teams versus versus singles it's it's interesting to hear, like, I guess, from somebody um, on the other side of that, because, you know, from my perspective, it's a symptom, not the disease itself. But like, you know, for example, this, the, the, the core idea that, you know, like you're taking uh, Eldari, for example, to this event is completely valid from the perspective of wanting to put your best foot forward, to, you, mm. to use your own words. Um, but I think, uh, you know, from like a... Uh, every faction having its time in the sun. I think singles event events are where dreams go to die um, <laughs> because of these exact issues where, mm. um, you know, uh, the the skill component, I suppose, of like and mastering those tournaments, a, a big part of that comes down to a combination of access to models, list writing and pre-event, uh, like pre-event work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Whereas I'm a huge fan of like intra event skill expression mm -hmm. and the reason why i like intra event skill expression just as a core concept and the reason why i like teams is because the pairings process from teams i think is the best example of that mm -hmm. um sure. and like w we've already spent i would argue more than 24 hours like net uh talking about about pairings a a as a team yep. and doing simulations and practice runs and that part of tournament prep that the, the pairings is the reason i fell in love with teams mm -hmm. um which is entirely absent of course from singles uh but you have no control over what you play mm. yeah it's um yeah you do raise a, a, a you know, i would i would agree with you um uh and that as well i think singles does have some element of that you know i think if you look at the best singles players they will be able to identify and predict what the other best singles players are taking. So there is so, sort of that intra meta game of of a singles players tournament. Obviously, we have the UK TC over here. So um, you know, if I were to go play a tournament, I'm looking at what X Y Z player who might be coming to the tournament, what they previously played, and there is that kind of pairings gambit. But you are completely correct in that there's a lot less in your control in terms of you can only play at the end of the day who gets put in front of you, and you've got no control on who, you know, who who's going to get put in front of you. Only only in the finals when maybe you expect you're going to play against Manu Chimera again, <laughs> finals or something like that, right? So that's the only control. yeah. You know, I've I've, I've had the the, the fortunate. Um... The fortunate opportunities over um the wtc that was in uh novosad in serbia and um uh, of course last year in mechelen i've had the uh, fortunate ability to to play a number of um uh, you know quite skilled singles players um like you know nick nanavati i've played ennis wilson twice mm -hmm. uh amy paris mm -hmm. um anthony vanilla and um yeah it's it's been it's been very eye-opening i think to um approach 
even singles events uh, and individual games, like with, with that kind of team's mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because I, I think I think from that list, I've dropped four battle points total. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's been an interesting run. Um, if if I may allow them, because this is a subject that comes up all the time, all the time yeah. the subject comes up, the difference between teams made of singles players and uh, ah. teams of, of players. And I know you've, I've, I'm, I'm, invariably you've had this conversation as well, all your teams had this conversation. I think, um, you know, one of the stories of, if we can transition a little bit here, one of the stories of, I think, Team England this year are that they have a huge singles player roster, so to speak. You know, they have, uh, at least from our perspective, so um, if the viewer or audience may not know this, if you play a lot in the UK here, you will recognize instantly every single name on Team England roster, maybe bar Chris Kinnear, as all players who have won Super Majors either consistently or, you know, won Majors consistently traveled abroad, played Vegas, top ITC, you know, five or whatever players in the world. Um, you know, do you find that, um, I guess I've been struggling with this question as well, so maybe you can help me. Do you find that teams, the teams that have the best skill expression players uh, is more powerful than the teams that have more preparation? Or where do you sit on that side of the fence of raw player skill versus team cohesion and preparation, so to speak? Firmly with the latter. I don't Firmly with the latter. That. Yeah, I don't have to think about that for more than a second. And, and I, I, I say that because, um, you know, I, I think that... Uh, okay, I, I'm going to preface what I'm going to say with the fact that I'm obviously you know, like the New Zealanders, um, I live in a small microcosm on the far butthole of the world. Yep. And part of that means that my exposure to 40K is largely my, my local community, mm-hmm. uh, the dudes who play games on my pool table on a Friday afternoon <laughs> uh, and the barbecues on a Saturday morning. But jokes aside, I also deliberately, quite specifically, don't um, keep up to date with... Mm uh the, the the trends from elsewhere and the reason i do that is not because i you know i desire willful ignorance but because i think that um one of the downsides of having this kind of like interconnected global 40k community is that we have a danger of becoming an echo chamber mm, right like we, kind of, we have this competitive idea this competitive build and it takes off and then you kind of run the risk of uh, people tech to fight that and then you have 50 percent of the field versus 45% of the other rest of the field and they're all just kind of countering each other. And then, you know, you have a select group of people who I think can come in with the remaining 5% of armies mm-hmm. and no one knows how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of been the the role that I see teams exacerbating where if you have a team that gels well together and you have a pairings crew that understand the pairings and how pairings works, I think better than anyone else, which I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very proud to say, I, I think that Australia does that. Um, our pairings team kicked it out of the park last year and I'm very, very happy to have everyone involved in that process uh, be involved again this year. Mm-hmm. And um, from from my perspective, I think that trumps having a team of champions rather than a championship team. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, last year, for example, um, like playing against uh, England and Poland and USA for, for the Australian team, Mm-hmm. That was kind of that was kind of manifest where there were some players with amazing resumes on on all of those teams mm. who've won super majors and whatnot. And then there's that Aussie dude who's never played at a tournament with more than fifty dudes, mm-hmm. um, and you know, like he kicked ass. And yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think the reason for that is that we I also approach this as what you talked about before. You know, the people who've like all those names are recognizable. Um, I think the danger of that is that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think for quite a lot of people, if you, um, David, if you play somebody at the singles event and, you know, your name is recognizable from your um, past, you know, tournament resume, I think there's a world, I I think you'd agree with this, where um, people do perhaps uh, play differently because they believe they're playing somebody of a very, very high caliber. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you go into that, the team's event with the same attitude, you're actually really liable to make mistakes. You have to actually treat everyone as if they're good. Treat everyone as if they're high caliber. 
Yes, I 100%. I could not agree any more than that. So oh, there's so many things to touch on there. I actually have a, I have an, I have objective markers that have gold signatures on it. So I get people to sign my objective markers. And <laughs> one of the, um, one of the uh, signatures I have the most, which I, I like the most, and I always place it in my deployment zone. It says victory is earned. And um, it's because I lost against um, Chase, uh, Chase Chamber. I'm going to burn her his last time. I lost against Chase at LVO, um, and it was a typical game of overconfidence. You know, I'm going to smash this guy. You know, it's another another round of playing some, um, you know, low skill player at LVO or whatever like that. You know, and and just got quickly got caught slipping in my jet lag and found out. And um, you know, that's a that's a great example. And me personally, I I'm under no illusion that uh, I'm the, I feel like I'm the small fish in the big pond. You know, because you go over to Europe. You don't know who any of these players are or something, you know, and then all of a sudden it's, you know, some European player they've never heard of before. And he's like, just as good, if not way better than you. And you're like, holy crap. Okay. I need to, I need to, you know, tighten the screws a little bit uh, here more than anything. Yeah. I mean, it, th there's definitely, a, so event success obviously suggests that you have the skills to win events. But just the act of winning an event in of itself doesn't mean you're actually a more skilled player than the player who came second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. Yeah. Because your tournament run, the, the faction you're playing, heck, the table that you you play on, depending on the format you're playing, uh, all have a significant role role in that. And I think that um, uh, players who are, I I would argue um, <laughs> I. I what I'm going to say is that I, I feel like from somebody again, who lives in the butthole of the world, mm -hmm. that the people who are prolific major or GT winners are also the people who are almost invariably prolific content producers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, uh, b because of that, I, I think it exacerbates this echo chamber problem yes. where you kind of have the, and, and you know, like I, I'm guilty of it too, where, you know, I have a small podcast here in Australia called The Normal Blokes, yep. um, which I shamelessly plug and ask you to it. listen to. I'm going to plug it. Um, <laughs> but, but also like, you know, when we get on that podcast and we talk about like, oh, like we won XYZ event. Of course, the people who are winning events are producing content about themselves winning events. Yes. And so you kind of create this weird microcosm where what you think is good is exactly, is, um, uh, distributed to yes. to many thousands of people yes. and it, it's just an interesting concept when i go to the northern hemisphere to, to, to play at wtc when i see and you know i think the same thing is said for this year is that if you look at the lists you see um a fair bit of control c control v mm -hmm. in a number of like powerful teams, yes. um, like you, you can see bleeding elements of like USA lists in other teams. Mm -hmm. um, some of the lists are approaching being exactly the same, mm -hmm. um, which is not a problem or a uh, benefit that Team Australia has. I think all of our lists are very different. <laughs> uh, man, there's so many things to touch on. Um, on the point of uh, exposure, I 100% agree. And the, the irony is that uh, um, I don't know if this episode is going to come out before or after, but uh, I said the exact same thing on the previous episode I recorded last night, which is that, you know, UK, USA players, obviously, you know, just tend naturally because of our exposure to get a lot more coverage, you know, in air quotes yep. coverage, right? And, you know, at the end of the day that I, I suspect very much that the skill difference is small at best between some of these teams, right? If you were to take a, uh, a, a team England or like a team Spain, for example, right? Um, I have absolutely zero doubt that Spain has an, an, an amazing roster of eight players that are extremely talented um, simply because they may perhaps don't get any coverage in English or or American, um, you know, you know, for lack of better words, 40K media <laughs> coverage, uh, yeah, so no, to speak. No, you know, no, it's, no. it's, it's you know, you, I think it's good to go in with a humble mindset to think actually the skill difference here, which is completely different in singles, of course. In singles, you leverage the skill difference as much as possible. Um, well, you try to at least. And, um, but in here, I think the skill difference is so, is a lot tighter. And you've then got preparation and team composition and pairings on top of that, which is are, are more elements that add uh, layers of impact uh, aside from skill differential, right? You know, you can only, you can only do what, you can only do the best with what you're served up, so to speak, yeah, exactly. in a game. So if you're, if you're, 
if you're making the wrong dish for the competition to begin with, then, you know, <laughs> you know you've, you've come out the wrong way. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, and, and it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, which I don't think, I don't know if we'll ever conquer that in Warhammer, isn't it? And I think your view of uh, success and is a very mature and good one. I wish I had that view when I was, <laughs> um, when I was first starting out, you know, I'm serious because, you know, yeah. I really struggled uh, with stuff like that. I thought, you know, the tournament was either I come first or it's a loss, right? Uh, and that's just such an unhealthy binary way of viewing um, success, um, you know, or, you know, success is even too strong of a word sometimes, you know, just enjoyment, right? Or pride, I think is probably a better way, you know, being proud of, you know, I think, I, performing. I think that's fair. And, you know, um, one of the things I love the most about 40k is how eclectic the 40k community is. I don't mm. mean that insultingly. I mean that whole, like, I'm, I love it. You know, um, uh, I always talk about, you know, the, the 2022 Team Australia has had, um, you know, uh, two doctors, uh, a university lecturer, <laughs> a social media manager, and then a dude who sells cabbages. Um, and, and you know, like, it's, it's such a eclectic group of people that bring a whole, like, diverse array of personalities and backgrounds and interests that all come together to throw dice at each other and talk mm. smack. And it, that's probably the thing for me that, like, um, and when you ask about, like, what success is, teams, 40K events, one of the things they do more than a singles event is you have this almost, um, I'm going to say cult-like, you know, uh, fanaticism that comes with going to an event like this. Like, you know, for yeah. us, for example, we've got the the shirts, the polos, the jackets, the dice, the <laughs> tape measures, the objectives, the lot. And we are all 13 of us. We're on the same flight over there. We are all meeting oh, in Melbourne. Great. In Australia, and all thirteen of us are flying like a like a goddamn rugby team, <laughs> and we are going through yeah, Brisbane, Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi to Belgium, and you know we're we're traveling as a team, we're eating as a team, we're shitting as a team, we're like honestly, like everything we're doing is as a team, and I love it. it's so intense that I just the first time I I went anywhere for a teams event, I, I knew this was like what I wanted to do. Yeah, it's this that level of camaraderie is unparalleled. Oh, it's so Even great. you know because obviously we have. Um, you know, main team so team ignite for example you know and we go to play singles events right and we replicate to that to some extent but we're not as well we i i, I am I, <laughs> I didn't mean to virtual signal there um i i'm invested in the success of my other uh, teammates but not to the same level of course as if we were all playing on the same team uh so to speak of course well d you know d david uh you're probably not going to coach your teammate on how to beat yourself yes you? no probably not um, that's a good where, point. whereas i have spent a long time teaching everyone how to kill lich guy yes um <laughs> because i'm invested in that yes uh, so I, I think that's the difference right we i am truly 100 percent committed on um uh, you know, the, the rest of my teammates kicking it out of the park. Mm. If you don't mind, uh, if we touch on the, we've got the pod stages, what oh, is yeah. the, what, you know, so we, we drew, <laughs> what was your reaction when uh, Team New Zealand okay. and Australia so, were in the same pod? <laughs> so I, I'm going to rewind a little bit. Uh, about two weeks ago, um, there was a Teams event in uh, Newcastle, Australia called Steel City Showdown, mm -hmm. where everyone from Team Australia attended that event and we were able to sort of hide our armies, et cetera, because we wanted to do some productive practice. Mm -hmm. At that event, um, I was on the phone to, to Neil, uh, one of the TOs, so, uh, sorry, Jay, one of the head judges, yep. and I clarified how the pod system worked. Mm. And he was like, we're going to have like first seed, second seed, third seed, fourth seed. And I made the joke. I actually asked him, I said, what's New Zealand? What's... <laughs> Well, well, I'm curious. And he's like, oh, it's, you know, it, 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 there's a chance that you play in New Zealand. And I was like, okay, so you're telling me there's a chance I can spend $5,000 dollary dues. I can fly all the way to Europe. And the first game that I play is going to be against someone from New Zealand. It is a five hour flight from where I live. And he's like, yes, that is a, that is a possibility. And lo and behold, this is where we are round one <laughs> australia versus new zealand which i think i think is an absolute laugh uh, um, i think it's great as well um what i do want to touch on before is that uh you know you, you <laughs> i can't help, i can't help it of course so you're going to see the new zealander come out me in uh, a little bit here you mentioned <laughs> um 
Uh, you said when you were all traveling on the airplane, all 13 of you were traveling like rugby team. Well, I hope it's not the Wallabies at the moment, mate, because we just smashed you 35 7. I'm sincerely hoping that uh, the maybe 0.001% of the Australians that give a rat's about Warhammer are going to feel redeemed round one when Australia, when Australia beats the game. Uh, yeah. That was the only caveat from the previous episode where I said, I will genuinely concede that Australia are better than New Zealand at uh, at Warhammer. I've got no qualms with that. Because we you've got ju- rugby. We did just smash them last night. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the Wallabies that's are looking great. terrible at the moment too, which is, <laughs> which is hopefully, yeah, that that's gonna be, hopefully that's not going to be the uh, flip side of the coin of the Warhammer coin, uh, so to speak. But, um, yeah, it is um, it is interesting. I, I would love to get your thoughts on, um, you know, New Zealand and Australia have a lot of history, and I think it's to me is a little bit like America, Canada and the brotherhood relationship. You know, we like to think that Australia are kind of our big brothers and, and, uh, and New Zealand likes to always punch above its weight in that, in that sense, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of banter and there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, chipping and jibing and, and poking shoulders at one another. But I think one thing that's always been true is that, you know, we live at the bottom of the world together and we're always, um, we're always, We've always got each other's backs, no matter how much we like to compete against one another. Is there sort of that sense in Warhammer as well? I guess because I've never, you know, been never travelled to play like the ANZ TC, which is a New Zealand Australia uh, ANZAC um, tournament, team tournament, for example, right? So yeah, I, I think there definitely is that kind of um, camaraderie. I, you know, I think that especially for the New Zealand boys who I've met, like like Alex Taus, for example, um, hung out with us quite a bit at Uprising Adelaide uh, back mm-hmm. in January. Um, I think that there's a fair bit of camaraderie and we, we, it's not toxic. I actually think it's quite um, wholesome in a way. There's almost a bit of a us and them mentality when mm. you kind of say, oh, like we, we're from the Southern Hemisphere. Like, yeah. you know, we're, we're coming up to fight all those Northerners. And it's, you know, <laughs> it's, you've really got to put on your really ochre bogan Australian accent and you've got to be like, <laughs> yeah, we're fighting them from up north. And, you know, it's like, we, it, it, it's a bit of fun at the end of the day. And it, I think it kind of grows with that shit talk. Mm. One thing that um, I kind of wanted to say as well with, with the, the smack talk of WTC, mm. one really weird phenomenon that I found last year was, so Australian and New Zealand 40K players um, do talk a fair bit of smack. We, we love love banter and, 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 you know, making fun of our own team, especially. Mm-hmm. But um, especially the Australian team and uh, a few uh, key players uh, who you'll meet, David, um, <laughs> are particularly adept at having a loud voice and talking 110% garbage all oh, of the time. I love it. This is great. Um, uh, and one thing that I found really fascinating was when we went to WTC last, last time, the Europeans love it. They have, they, I'm sorry, they, they actually do. Like, it's it's incredible. It's it's like, honestly, I tell, I, like, I'm just going to say, I tell Matt Morozoli to just shut up sometimes, like, like quite a bit, actually. Like, he does need to shut up. But then we go over there and Soli takes off his shoe and puts his sh- foot on the table and goes, Typhus, suck my toes. And everyone loved it. The, the people are clapping and people uh, are laughing. And I'm like, what is happening? What is going fantastic. on here? This, it's like going into the twilight zone when you know you're just being as obstructive and obstinate as humanly possible oh, and yeah. the people you're annoying are loving it it's in, it's, it's, it's boggled <laughs> the mind i just didn't understand but um but honestly it, it kind of eggs eggs us on a little bit like obviously you go over there and you're like oh yeah you know uh, like one thing you, you'll see david is i i have a pair of tournament pants that i oh, wear yes. at tournament. i have uh, these pink hawaiian pants that i got nice. given for my bucks party I always wear them on the last day of tournaments because 40k players is a superstitious lot at baseline. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I had about four or five players offer to talk to, like they asked me, like, "Oh, do you live at Bondi?" Or like, you know, all like the Australian <laughs> stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it was just great. It that sounds good. Was. I'm going to load yeah. up my best Australian, uh, Australian insults and banter uh, before doing it. I'm going to come fully loaded. It's on. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a few underarm balls at our game. <laughs> uh, we deserve that that's fair uh, but 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 the ball has been tampered with so oh that's um, good i remember so for context um liam and i were chatting a couple of nights ago trying to organize an interview and i said um uh, i said to liam i said you know i wouldn't i would i wouldn't want to play anyone else apart from australia i think uh round one maybe canada maybe have a chance of winning that one and <laughs> um because i thought you know who better than to have someone in our corner and i i thought 
if there was any team that was going to be like, look, you guys need to like, I think your lists, lists or strength are like this. And I think you should lean into this. Like maybe, you know, oh, we've looked at Belgium and Portugal or at our pool. And, um, you know, I think we think these are kind of the weaknesses in their list, maybe try and go for that. And whether or not that happens or not, I would thought if there was any team that was going to give us some couple of hints or, twi- uh, or tweaks or something like that, I was like, you know, I'd rather have someone from that Southern Hemisphere uh, be the be the C1 team. <laughs> that's <laughs> fair. That's pretty fair. <laughs> From a losing um, perspective, the the pod system's interesting, right? You know, it um, it I think it promotes an overall uh, interesting, let's say, back end to the event. Mm. Um, uh, you know, it definitely makes the semifinals and quarterfinals and whatever t- to be quite exciting. But by the same token, it also um can be a little bit artificial in the sense that you you kind of avoid the the potential of playing. USA round yeah. one, um, whereas like you know Romania have to fight it out or whatever it is, <laughs> it, um, it it is a little bit artificial. The other thing that's weird, and I I, I I'm not sure if you agree with this, David. I, I'm I'm assuming you do, is that I feel like in tenth edition more than ninth edition, the mission changes how good a game is for you quite profoundly. Mm. Um, I I think the biggest thing last edition was, is it a whole two or is it a whole one mission? And that was kind of about it uh, with the exception of like, maybe some of them are sticky Mm -hmm. uh, objectives. That was kind of about it. Uh, But now, um, you know, like for example, the round we're playing on for for Pete's sake is the mission where at the end of the game, there's only one objective. Yes. They offer Um, Omega. I'm, I mean, look, I've got 40 Necron warriors that are OC3. I mean, you tell me what's good on that mission. I mean, like, (laughs) Like, you know, it, but it, it, for example, if you're playing that mission against um, uh, another team, I think that quite profoundly changes your pairings. And so the pod system means that, and I felt like the WTC organizers picked, let's say the more scandalous missions for the pod phase of mm. the event um, and kind of the more uh, standard missions for the latter stage of the event. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I I completely agree with that. The missions seem to have a much larger impact, and I think that all I, I you know some missions, for example, like doesn't actually matter if you hold your home field objective. Like, okay, yeah. like I guess we're just jamming everything in the middle, and that's the mission. That's the objective that's uh, going to be there at the end of the game. So I put most of my army over there. You know, yeah, um, and, and that's it, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, doesn't take a genius to work this one out. Um, yeah, so I, I agree that the missions seem to um, seem to have impacted a lot. How have you guys? A, I guess I'm not sure if you're aware, but we had a bit of a rant or a tirade about 10th edition uh, when it first came out. Um, how have you found 10th edition? Are you enjoying it? Would you have preferred WTC to be 9th or 10th edition? Is an interesting question. Um, so, uh, two parts to your question. Sorry, the, the first part is: Am I enjoying tenth edition? The answer is: Yeah, I am actually. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that there are there are problems in the game, um, but I think that initially I was a bit down because I felt that the games always had problems. But what I was worried about most was that I felt the skill expression elements of the game had been reduced. Mm-hmm. Quite specifically, the the combat phase, uh, yep. try pointing enemy mm-hmm. models tagging things like that just the introduction of big guns never tire into the game full stop i felt was a a mistake um and as i tested and played more of the game i'm not as concerned about that as i as i once was i think there still is quite a lot of skill expression because of the reduction in the prevalence of fallback shoot and charge um the change to fly how Mm -hmm. movement works there's actually still quite a lot of skill expression in the game Mm -hmm. i love tactical cards i'm sorry i don't i don't care if that's not a competitive but i love it so much tactical i edit. miss the old, i miss the old maelstrom cards and i know oh. as soon as they brought back cards and it's like yes like you're the worst cool. oh honestly i love it i love it so much <laughs> um and i i have like honestly I, I love it enough that that has made me really like the game and um probably the the biggest ticket item for me and the reason why i actually do like 10th um is that I actually do feel like, jokes aside, that the OC mechanic is one of the best changes to come to the game I've ever encountered in the time I've been playing 40k. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of negatives uh, this edition as well, but I I think that the OC uh, characteristic is very interactive. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to work out. 
And doing away with the whole concept of objective secured mm -hmm. is such a good thing for the game. Um, I think I, I think objective secured was a cancer. Mm. Um, and I honestly think that uh, we've we've cut it out, and this is this is a better version of that. Um, yeah, I see. We I see where you're coming from with the expansion of toughness, for example. The introduction of objective um, control uh, has allowed for the stratification of that design space, really, hasn't it? It's it's a more open yeah. design space for where they can build stuff in. I think. Um, uh, oh no, go for it, go for it. Oh, sorry. Uh, just the the, the, the second. Um, uh there was a second part to your question i'm sorry uh, would rather... you rather wtc be ninth or tenth i take it you'd rather it be tenth yeah so i'd rather it be tenth but actually nothing to do with my enjoyment value mm. um it's well that's actually, that's not fair i would not enjoy going to prep for months for an event for me to then play rules that are invalid prior to the event yeah um and I understand that that attitude uh, can be problematic because, of course, it reduces the time we can prep. And I, I fully understand that. But personally, I would not like to put the hundreds and hundreds of hours that I have put in and will continue to put in for WTC to then, like, for example, not be able to play local events for a while because mm -hmm. all the local events will be playing 10th and mm -hmm. um, not be able to test uh, at Teams events locally because they're all playing 10th and I'm playing 9th. I, I think it has more problems than benefits, so mm -hmm. I'm glad we're playing 10th. Fantastic. There we go. Glad we're playing 10th. You're right. There are there are some problems with it, but I think I've been, you know, I've been enjoying 10th overall as well. Uh, however, the singles events, I think, the single side of it is a little bit dire at the moment. Oh, um, yeah. But but um, that's I think that was to be expected. And the good part about teams is that teams invariably solves so many of the issues that singles uh, right. has as well. And so. it's kind of what I said before. I, I feel like singles, again, I play singles events. I will play singles events. I'm playing a singles event with you in like, in like <laughs> a week's time. But I do think singles is where dreams go to die. Because <laughs> if you are, you know, you're, if you are really enthusiastic about XYZ faction, uh, the question at the moment you're asking yourself is not can i do well with x faction it's how much how many wraith knights can i buy if i sell my army <laughs> and it, it, it it's a bit it's a bit grim i i i don't think that that is um obviously i'm talking in wild hyperbole uh, mm. and i fully understand that that's not the case for all singles events I, I do understand that but i also do have a point right where i think that the singles meta is obviously quite stacked at the top end with mm. a, a very limited list of factions and um team solves that problem because everyone's going to have the same tools mm -hmm. and you've got to try and solve those problems to the best of your ability and the the best thing in the world about teams is that if you lose 14 6 to an eldari player and you know those six points that you get against the Eldar player who thought they were going to get 20 um that that can be your success your mm -hmm. your your parameters for success are defined completely differently and I think that's just so healthy uh, psychologically. It's not all win lose. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, teams has been a big uh, growing point for me, and uh, hopefully, I'm sure I'm sure it's going to be a growing point as well. I'm doing the singles. I'm doing the team event. I'm doing most likely be doing the pairings against, uh, I guess, yourself or the team of coaches as well. Uh, and then I'll be doing the coaching as well. Uh, and then I'll be doing the playing as well. So we're, <laughs> we're seeing just how multifaceted I can, be, I can become in a certain sense. Here. How much Red Bull do you drink? Um, not enough. I'm quite a big coffee fan, though. So we're going to be yeah. we're hoping it'll be OK. So. Yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully everything will be good. I've got a, a lot on your plate. Yeah, I've got to. Uh, I'm doing some pairing simulations uh, later today. I've luckily the only bit, you know, well, not the only bit, but one of the one of the benefits I have is that in my main team, my singles team, is that we have five WTC players. It would have been six, but five WTC players, all from different nations. So some of them are not playing against each other, and some of them are, I, I messaged and said, "Hey, do you mind if I do some pairing simulations and I'll help you out? You know, you're playing against this team. I'll I'll, I'll pretend to be them and we'll do pairing sims and stuff like that." So that's the uh, that's the best part about 40k. All brings us so, together. I, I actually had an interesting question question for you. I'm, I'm going Go to turn the onus no, you back on you, David. Of course. Um, so I, I heard from the the the, the Kiwi birds that um, there there are some people on the team you're playing for you've never met. Yes, I've never met most of them. Yes, I've actually. I've that never... feels profoundly wrong. 
<laughs> yeah, there's there's uh, there's about twenty twenty thousand kilometers that separates us. But um, yeah, funny. yeah, you're right. Um, it's a bit of a unique situation, is it? It's funny because actually in Las Vegas, um, I think some of the New Zealand crew came to play. Um, uh, people like uh, Finn Decker, for example, and whatnot. Yeah, who you guys are more familiar with. Um, I think they all went four and one as well. And I, I talked to them. I said, "How come you guys didn't come uh, play WTC?" And they're like, "Oh, we didn't really know this year." And I thought, "Ah, oh, well, you know, that's fine. That's fine. Maybe, uh, maybe the year after or something like that." Um, so that's for me is a big goal is to be able to just build up enough hype and success to bring another team another year, right? Like that's the bar that kind of I think I think would be success for us. Um, but yeah, it's it's. It's interesting. I mean, the, the great part about Aussies and Kiwis is that, you know, they're all pretty easy to get along with, aren't they? So I have no, uh, I have no doubt that we're going to be uh, doing this. I mean, we've been chatting on, obviously, you know, we have uh, a Discord um, for the team and I've been kind of overseeing the list and stuff like that and passing on as much information that I can glean from this side and from my teammates who are in teams and what like that and doing scrims and stuff to try and make sure our lists are kind of competitive as possible. And I think that's from a singles perspective, like that's the most direct way you can contribute in a certain sense, right? Make sure you're turning up with the right tools. Um, make sure you've got um, at least, you know, at least competitive lists. And I think the, as I talked about in a previous episode, the layers of complexity that I think a team like Team Australia can display is that you can, it's one thing to just have eight good, well-rounded lists, but in teams, if you do the matrix and the pairings and you work out that, you know, you've got space, design space for some lists to be skewed to a certain extent. I think that's really evident in the list that you guys have brought, for example, where you've incorporated the layers of complexity of pairings onto your list design rather than just simply having eight good lists that you think will be all right to bring competitive games. Um, certainly recognize that. And I think I'm really excited to see how Australia do. You guys have got a very high bar to succeed. And I think in the previous episode, I had Typhus on and he said, I said, I asked him the question, if there was one team that was going to underperform, who would it be? And he said, well, you know, that would kind of have to be Australia to a certain degree, wouldn't it? They won best sporting, they won the singles, they won the teams. So, you know, there's only, you can either stay where you are or, or it's only down from here. But I know that you guys, are, I think you've got the, um, I think you've got the capabilities to really drive it home. I've been really impressed hearing about just the levels of camaraderie and practice that you guys have been putting in. And I think one thing that's thematic that I've learned over the contact lost episodes interviewing captains is that the impact of preparation and teamwork is extraordinary. So I think that's really positive. I could see that uh, Liam is uh, nodding off to someone on the side there. So Liam, if there's any final words, we're just sitting in the hour mark. If there's any, no, words, no, I, no you, you're, you're all good. My wife just came to make a coffee. She's oh, working. I'm so sorry. No problem. <laughs> anyway, um, no, look, I, um, I'm really looking forward to every year at WTC. I meet a whole bunch of different new people. Um, it's a great experience, and I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm an addict at this point, and I'm mm -hmm. coming back for more. Um, really excited for it, and looking forward to meeting you in person. Sounds great. I'll shamelessly plug that at the Go end. If that's cool. So um, we're a podcast called The Normal Blokes. We're Normal a podcast blokes, right. dedicated to improving the competitive footage. <laughs> You're old blokes as well, aren't you? <laughs> And um, you can hear my wife working the coffee machine in the background. Really sorry about that. Um, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, wherever you find your podcasts. We talk a, a lot of smack uh, and we're kind of focused on local events um, and the general attitude of improving the competitive 40K experience. Awesome. I'm going to be tuning into some of that because I got a lot of painting to do because my army has uh, just been assembled two days ago. So that's what I'm going to be listening to today then while I'm uh, working from home. There we go. Liam Hackett, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I've learned a lot, which is great because that's why I pretty much do this is just to get better at 40K, really. So uh, I'm going to be stealing a lot of things. Um, and thank you very much for coming on. It's been great. I'm going to be really enjoying seeing and meeting you guys and Team Australia in one week. No, oh, no. no, no worries, <laughs> No worries. <laughs> Thanks very much. Have a good one, Liam. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for listening to the 40K Fireside Podcast. Book and I hope you've enjoyed listening and we greatly appreciate any feedback that you can provide after the show. 